Trivedi uh, to come and uh, take over uh, and chair the session. Thank you, sir. Welcome back after delicious lunch. I have been assigned the job to chair the session after lunch. So I hope I will try to keep you awake. Uh, we have a first keynote speaker. That is Professor David Weinberger, Harvard University. Professor Weinberger is a leading thinker about the net's effect on business and ideas. Uh, he has brought a thought thoughtful approach to his work as an early web entrepreneur, a best-selling author, technologist, and researcher. Interesting to know that he has his PhD in philosophy. He was co-director of Harvard University Innovation Lab and is a senior researcher at Harvard's Ber Berkman Center for Internet and Society. His work has appeared in journals as different <coughs> as Wired, Harvard Business Review, CNN.com, Salon, State Atlantic.com, Scientific American, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and TV Guide, and he has keynoted conferences around the world. He is the co-author of the Clue Train Manifesto, considered a seminal work in internet business. His latest book, Too Big to Know, is about the networking of knowledge. He has been an advisor to presidential campaign, a Franklin Fellow, at the U.S. State Department from 2009 to 2011. So please welcome Professor Weinberger. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, <clears throat> for having me. This is uh, it's a remarkably rich morning, I, I, I think we'll all agree. Um, and these were just some of the, the words and phrases that we heard. It was too, too rich a selection to be able to do anything except capture some. So what I want to talk with you about today is what I think is the techno technological infrastructure that is emerging. It's not here yet, but it, there are signs that it's going to be real. Um, the infrastructure that will allow for us to achieve so many of the, of the common goals and values, and will let libraries be more of what they are, or I think more exactly, let libraries be what they've always been, but more fully. That's the hope, anyway. Um, but I want to take a big step back. So the basic problem has been that our brains are very, very small. The world is very, very big. And when our little brains try to understand the world, it, they can't. So we've had, um, certainly in the West, and I have, I have a terrible American accent, and I apologize, but at least in the West, the basic strategy for dealing with this basic problem, little brain, big world, has been to try to reduce knowledge to what our brains can manage. And we have all sorts of techniques for doing that, many of which have been enabled and advanced by writing, um, which obviously has been the medium of knowledge and continues to be. But writing turns out it's wonderful at many things. I, I don't feel like I have to defend writing to a room full of librarians. But it has a number of terrible limitations that we've been used to because it's been the only medium that we've had. And much of what we think about what knowledge is is, in fact, based upon silently has been shaped by the limitations of the paper medium that we've had. had. But now we have a new medium which is the internet, a new medium for knowledge, as well as for other things. And so we should expect that our idea of knowledge will be reshaped by its new medium, just as the old one was. And the, there are many problems with the internet, but capacity is not one of them. The internet has infinite capacity, which writing and libraries simply don't. Every library throws out books or recycles books. Um, as new ones come in, because books and libraries and pages and paper are, are all physical objects and suffer from the limitations of the physical, as well as the glories of the physical. So imagine it's 1919. You've been very interested in Einstein, this young physicist that you've read about, very interesting. And you are waiting for the critical experiment that, uh, that will sit, tell us whether Einstein's crazy theories were right. And this depended upon a an eclipse, um, and the first available eclipse was 1919. You're waiting for the news. This is the New York Times from that day. It gets 
uh, thrown up onto your porch. It's the morning. You read it. It's a front page story. And it turns out Einstein was right, of course. Um, but you're reading this. And you're very excited about it. You're curious about it. You have so many questions. You want more information. Of course you do, because this is you get this rectangle of information, and that's it. But you cannot get any more information, because it's 1919. And this is the limitation of paper. There are no hyperlinks. There's nothing, there is nothing else to read that morning, no matter how many questions you had. And we've gotten used to this uh, limitation of paper. We've taken it for granted. But it's a terrible, terrible limitation. It's a limitation on human curiosity and on our ability to know. So now imagine it's 2011, and there's new data that's coming out of the Large Hadron Collider, the most important physics experiment on the planet. And this new data, this is the faster than light neutrino data, doesn't matter. Um, it, but it suggested that Einstein was wrong. So this is very important data. And so if you're one of the scientists who discovered this data, you could put it on paper. You could get it published in any of the standard journals. They would be thrilled to have this, because this may be showing Einstein was wrong. So you could get it published anywhere. But instead, you published it immediately. As soon as the data came in, you posted it at archive.org, which many of you are familiar with, which is an open access site. It's an open site. Anybody can post anything they want there if they have some scientific affiliation. And so people post full articles, rough drafts. In this case, this was the first draft uh, of very important data. So why did they post it there? First of all, because they wanted the information to get out immediately, not have the year and a half that it would take to go through um, the, the peer review process and get published in paper, on paper. This is a non-peer reviewed site. So they posted it there for speed, but they wanted speed primarily because they didn't understand this data. They couldn't believe this data. I assume Einstein was right. So they didn't understand it, so they wanted to post it so that everybody could comment on it, so a discussion could begin, so a conversation, an important word from this morning, um, could begin. Uh, and that's what happened. It went up on the web, and everybody who was interested could always find out more. This is the opposite of how it worked with the old newspaper. If you wanted to know more, you could spend the rest of your life clicking on links to find out more about this. And you could contribute. You could get information at any level of expertise, whether you were a high school student, or you were a journalist, or you were a senior physicist. You could engage. You could argue. You could interact. So where did knowledge about the faster-than-light neutrino experiment live? It lived on the net, of course. This is the only place you could go to get information about it. But it didn't just live on the net passively. The knowledge existed in the links between these things. A web grew up, a web of disagreement and difference, usually civil and polite. But nevertheless, this web was only interesting because each of these people, whether they were bloggers or physicists or students, each was saying something different. And so this is a web of knowledge, a, a, a knowledge that exists in its difference and disagreements, in its links. Not possible in the paper world. That's not how knowledge looked or acted in the paper world. But this is the natural way knowledge looks when you take away the limitations of paper. It wants to engage and disagree and argue and ask questions and probes and probe. And so knowledge did not live here. It did not live here. It did not live here. It lived in the, in the interactions and in the links and the network itself. Knowledge is that network. It is not a content of that network. It is not the one right thing on the network. It is the network now of link disagreement. And so I think that what we, from my point of view, if that's roughly right, if that's what knowledge looks like now, then I think the question we should be asking is how do we help our users build smarter networks? Networks that have fewer lies in them, fewer falsehoods, uh, that are better, better enable users to discover and to engage and to figure out what to believe and what not to. So how do we build smarter networks? And I want to suggest three ways of doing this, three aspects of it. And the first is we need smarter information. Because data is, is dumb. Data is stupid. Data has no meaning. 926, that's data. Uh, so? It doesn't mean anything. 
It doesn't mean anything until metadata is added to it, information about the information. Ah, so this is a distance. I see. It's kilometers. And then a little more information is added, that this is, in fact, a difference, distance from here to there. And now it becomes not just data. It becomes information. It becomes useful. It's become smarter. And that's because of the metadata. Metadata makes data smarter. So we should be asking, I think, one of the things we should be asking is what does metadata look like in this new world? Well, we know what it looks like in the old world, where we got very good. It's very hard to do this sort of cataloging right. I understand that. I'm not a librarian. I've spent some time with li librarians. and I, I understand a, a bit, a bit of how difficult it is to do this sort of work, not to mention all the other work. But the process of, of taking of finding the right metadata and putting it onto a card so that users can walk through the card catalog instead of the, the shelves, the, the many, in some cases, kilometers of shelves, that process is a process of reducing the information and doing it very smartly. We got good at it, but it's a matter of reducing the information in the book to what fits on a file card. It's a terrible reduction of information. It's throwing out all sorts of information that might help somebody find a book or a work they didn't know about, something that is, at one, that is uh, not in one of the top three subject headings, um, a connection that somebody else made. We paid a terrible price for doing this so well. Our whole attitude towards metadata was to reduce it and to separate it from the thing itself, separate the card from the book. So let me first check. Um, can you hear me, and am I speaking too fast? OK, well, that's all, only people in the front are saying it's OK. You know? OK, so uh, I'll pretend that, sure, it's great. OK, I gave you your chance. So what does metadata look like in the new world, in the new electronic world? Well, it looks like this. So I'm going to use, if you don't mind, an American example, Moby Dick. And let's say you can't remember the name of that book, but you remember who wrote it. Herman Melville is the author. So you go to your search engine, you click. And you'll get back the author's name that you were looking for because it is out of copyright. You'll get the entire book. And in fact, let's change the example. Let's say you have a quote in your head, which you say, Wait, what book had, in what book does it say, call me Ishmael? And I think it might even be the very first sentence, which it is. You got lucky. So you type that into your search engine. And you, again, will get back the author. You'll get back the book, the entire content of the book. So what's happened here? In fact, this is not all that you'll get back. I mean, we all know what happens when we use a search engine. We get back the thing we're looking for. But then we will also get back on the front search page or one click away, everything. We'll get back uh, Melville's social, social circle of the time is the other author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and, and his bibliography and the time that he and Hawthorne went up on a mountain in, in Massachusetts in the US and had a conversation about something, a map to his house to get back information about whales, the biology of the whale, the ecology of the whale. You'll get back Al Gore. You will get back everything because it's all connected. This is very much not like the metadata of old, but it's a really wonderful thing. Because it turns out, remember, metadata was something that we separated from the physical object and reduced. This is the opposite. It turns out that the only difference between metadata and data is metadata is the thing that you know, and data is the thing that you're looking for. If you know Herman Melville's name, that's metadata that you can use like a lever to pry up something you don't know, which is the name of the book. If you know the quote, that's metadata by which you can pry up Herman Melville's name and everything else. So it's neither separate nor is it contained in a nice little box. And this is wonderful because if metadata, we've, we've used metadata as, as a crowbar, as a way of prying up new information. So if everything now is metadata, we just got much, much smarter. We're not confined to what's on a, a small 3 by 5 card, uh, inch card. We are, everything is metadata. Everything is connected to everything else. That makes us, as a species, much smarter than we were 20 years ago, simply because of the presence of this linked network. So one of the things that's changing that's um, I think really important is that we've had the idea of metadata as a sort of second object, a shadow object that gets, gets attached to the thing. In this case, it's Dante's in, uh, Inferno. And so we have a metadata with slots. Um, and this has worked really, really well. 
we all know there are limitations. For example, in the US, the, meta, the Mark 21 does not have, the metadata schema for, for books does not have a slot for reincarnation. I was, when I was at the Harvard Library Innovation Lab, um, a local group, the, the Tibetan Re, uh, Buddhist Resource Center, wanted to integrate their document information into ours, um, which we were, they had 10 million objects, that's great. We were very, very happy about that. We like that sort of integration. Um, and it was an easy conversation because we say to them, okay, well, we have, we have authors. And they say, well, we have authors. We keep track of that. We have titles. Oh, we have titles. We have dates. We have dates. And we go down the list. It's easy, easy. And then they say, but there is one more thing. It's really important within our culture to know who the author is a reincarnation of. And we say, well, sorry, that's not part of our metadata system. We didn't think that was important because metadata is highly cultural. And so we figured out how to do it. We used a miscellaneous slot. But one of the problems with metadata it, as a reduction is that it re forces choices that we don't want to make. It forces a type of cultural bias, inevitably. So one of the things I think is happening is that this notion of metadata as a separable object is Going away, that's too strong, but is being, there's a new way of doing things. So Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web as a gift, gave it to us without copyright and without patent, so a genuine gift to the world. In 2006, he also invented linked data. Are any of you familiar with linked data? Yes. Yeah, oh, a few of you are. That's unfortunate because you, you are going to recognize what a terrible job I'm about to do explaining it, and I apologize. So one of, the, one of the ways of thinking about linked data, which is a really important new standard, um, is that it takes metadata as a rectangle, as a set of fields that have been decided ahead of time, and it throws away the rectangle. It keeps all the information, of course, but it throws away the concept of a record, of a, this shadow object that goes along with the thing itself. So you take all of the information, I'm just taking a little because for simplicity's sake, you take all of the information and you do this weird thing of turning it into what are called triples. A triple is basically a, a sentence that has two objects that are connected by a relationship. I know, I know it sounds weird, but it actually sort of works. So you take all of the information from the metadata that you have, plus whatever other metadata you can find or connect or want, want to keep track of, including reincarnation. Reincarnation is important. Good, just add it in. That's just another sentence, another triple. And you can connect all of these in vast, vast webs of messy links. I made this up, so don't take it too seriously, but imagine this with 5,000 of these facts and more and more being added all the time. You can then, so you can see this is a set of triples that are connected to other triples. Is this sort of making sense? Okay, mm, okay. <laughs> so now you can take another set of triples about something else, and in this case, um, it's the Garden of Earthly D Delights, which is a, a, a famous uh, um, painting in three parts. You know, it's a, a triptych of hell, and you can start to connect things. So, oh, Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch is also about hell. So here's a joint connection, and then you can start to explore as a human being, or more likely, you can ask your computer to do it, you can see that they're, oh, well, this is a little interesting because Garden of Earthly Delights is about hell, so is the Inferno. The Inferno is part of a trilogy. The Garden of Earthly De Delights is a three-part painting. Maybe there's something about the afterlife and the number three we can explore, which I think is not a very good idea, but okay, let's explore further. We can see, we can use our computers, in fact, to see whether uh, mentions of hell and, and, and the afterlife, in fact, there's a lot of threeness there. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but we can explore that now. So we can find relationships that otherwise would have been invisible or very difficult to detect. This is a, creates a very rich environment. And then you can layer on top of this. This is books, but there's linked data collections about the weather, about history, about TV shows. There's a growing number of sets of linked data about all sorts of things, about authors, about professors, about universities. And they have common touch points because everything in the world is linked. That's what makes it a world. It's all linked. So the linked data has all of these connections that are otherwise obscure and now can be, can be made obvious. You can see whether uh, 
whether British romantic poets who are very gloomy in what they write, you can check that against mashed up with a metadata, sorry, data about the weather that's been gathered in, in this form and, and find out what proportion of English romantic gloomy poets were brought up in cities that had a lot of rainfall. So there's a, an hypothesis that would be extremely easy, well, easy to test. So this is a huge mess. It looked like a mess. It's way messier than what I showed you because some of these can be, there, there's a project going on at Cornell, Harvard, and Stanford in which we are simply taking our catalog information, plus a bunch of other stuff, but the catalog information and turning it into linked data. And for those three collections, it's likely to be, just for the catalog information, 25 billion. Um, so billion means different things in different languages, different cultures. For me, a billion is a thousand millions. 25 billion of these statements just for the card catalogs. So the problem is, so it's a big mess. Order does not scale. If you want things to be nice and orderly, you have to remove tons of information. We'll end up back with the card catalog, which was very, very orderly, but very tiny, the information that was captured. Or if you want a lot of information, you cannot impose order on it, at least from the beginning. Order does not scale. This is a, mess, a lesson from the internet overall, and it's certainly true in this case. But messiness, messiness scales, gets as big as you want. You want a big mess? You can make the biggest mess ever. Messiness gets very, very big. And the good thing about that is that messiness scales meaning. Because those connections among all those pieces are meaning. It's what the thing means. It's the connection to everything else. And that's at least what I mean by meaning. So messiness scales meaning. And that is a wonderful thing. That is a huge change in human history, as far as I can tell, that we now can scale, order, uh, scale connection all the way up without ever having to wonder, uh, do I have to reduce the font to get it to fit on the card? No. Anything you want now can be added to this gigantic global mess. OK, so the second thing that I think we need to do to make smarter networks is to build smarter networks. And we are now in a wonderful opportunity to do so. Uh, it used to be that libraries, the model was people would go, they'd check their books out or whatever, take them home and read them, and then discuss them amongst the, themselves. So that's because that's how we make meaning. That's how we discover what things mean to us and what matters. So people would. At breakfast, they would have a discussion, or in the US, the cliche is at the water cooler at work. They would have these discussions and make these objects theirs. They would understand them together. And humans have been doing this right from the time that we were doing those cave paintings. Libraries were absent from that to a large degree, not entirely, to a large degree because the works were physical and people were taking them home. But now, Increasingly, the works are not physical. They are electronic, which means that they, people are engaging in conversations, as we know, all across the globe in all the ways that, you know, from Twitter to Facebook and everything else. But that also means that the, for the first time, the library can learn from those conversations if they're in public. Um, it can sponsor those conversations. It can participate in those conversations and the making of meaning that used to be done privately. This is a wonderful opportunity for libraries. It enables them to go beyond anything that they've been able to do so far and to be more of what they've always been and have always wanted to be. So because this is, when this is happening in public means the libraries can participate, they can harvest the best ideas and, and then use, excuse me, use that to stimulate conversations in another set of their users. I didn't realize that, uh, that Three might be important in discussions of the afterlife. And over here, there's another conversation among other users um, that is about the afterlife. Maybe the librarian can suggest. Maybe the library can say, well, here's what other people in our community are talking about. They've noticed this threeness. Maybe you can learn from the other conversations in your community and maybe even beyond. And what you're learning ultimately is what matters to that community, what they care about, what they are talking about, what library works they're using. Important parentheses here. All of this has to be done within the bounds of preserving privacy. What we do know the younger generation doesn't care nearly as much about privacy as we do. Nevertheless, even if you protect privacy to the utmost, there will be a tremendous amount 
that users are making public knowingly and on purpose and getting enjoyment from it that we can learn from and that will enable the library to see and then the community to see what matters to it, what it cares about, what sense the world is making to that community and how that community is making sense of the world. And that sense making is what holds a community together. And by the way, when I say community, I'm not thinking only of local geographic communities, but any set of people who share interests. OK, so th this is, now it's going to get a little bit uh, OK. So third thing is building smarter services. But which services? What services should we build? It's a really good question to which there is no answer. We cannot know what the answer to that question is. And not because we're stupid or we don't care. It's because human beings are, are um, in, in American English, we would say squirrely. We, they are impossible to predict what they're going to be interested in. They're interested in this, and they turn. We don't know what's going to be of interest, what services people are going to want. And so we cannot possibly anticipate all the services. We, of course, we anticipate some, but we cannot anticipate all of them. And so one of the important technological advances over the past couple decades that's coming to libraries uh, in bits and pieces um, is the rise of platforms. So let me tell you what I mean by a platform, because it means different things. Um, I'm thinking about open platforms. And what I mean by that is basically an application programming interface or an API. And let me explain how many of you are uh, comfortable with an API. That's a, actually a really good number. I'm going to explain it anyway. Sorry. So um, an API is software that sits between um, applications and content. So you have a whole, this is just a little bit of what you have. You have a whole, at the library, has a whole set of different types of content. And then there are services written on top of it. Um, the one that my group uh, sort of, well, that my group made for Harvard Library is called Library Cloud. It's open source, and you can go visit it. You can take the code and build on it or whatever you want. <clears throat> so an API, for example, let's say you want to build an online catalog, an OPAC. You're going to have a user who's going to want to look something up. So maybe it's, um, you know, uh, I, I'd like some information. I want to get the, the, uh, a web page about um, Dante's Inferno. And so the user presses on a button or types something into the online catalog. The online catalog as software has a way of expressing requests like that. And it doesn't matter what it is. I made it really simple. I want to know about uh, works whose title includes Inferno, just a basic keyword sort of search. The, this message gets sent by that. I have a pointer here if I can get it right. Center. Center, thank you. It's not even, this, is, this isn't even your pointer, so that's very good intuition here. So this application is going to um, se send a query, has a question, every th tell me every work that has Inferno in it, the API is going to take that request and translate it into, um, into a language that the different things, different uh, cl data collections that you have, um, sorry, we want information about the Inferno, uh, we want to know what the catalog has and also maybe your holdings data or the availability or whatever. In this case, we'll just take these two. The API translates that request into one that the catalog software understands and translates it into a uh, request that the holding software understands. And who knows what they're, you know, how these um, data sources expect to get requests and so forth. Don't have to know because the API knows. And so each of these then responds with the right information, catalog information, holdings information, that get, then gets sent back to the online catalog, which is able to turn this into information that the user can read. The crucial thing is this API is a translation layer. It means that if you want to write software, a different catalog, different software that's going to request information from the library's data collections, you don't have to know what the data collections are. All you have to know is what, how the API expects you to ask questions like title equals Inferno and author equals Dante or Dante star or whatever. You just have to know how the API works and then your, your software will get the right information. This is really important because you do not live in stable environments. Libraries just are not. You're constantly getting, oh, sorry, ahead of myself by one slide. So the consequence of this is that if you are building sites, you have to build new sites, or there's some site off in the world that wants to use your data because it's open data, perhaps. It's extremely easy. 
It's, it could not be easier. You write your, your site, and it's always talking to the API. It's always talking the same language. It's a simple language, and you get your information back. It also means that when you want to create new apps and services, couldn't be easier. You write your application. It, when it needs information, it knows how to talk to the API. This also means that anybody on the planet who wants to write an application that uses your data is enabled to. Can, that person can if you've made the data open and if you've published the language that the API speaks. And if you, are, if you get a demand from your university or your business, let's say it's your business, some new Apple thing comes out and you need to support it right away because your analysts have to have it next week so they'll look cool, it's easy. You write your application for the device. You don't have to know about how any of this works. You just have to know how to talk to the API. And the API is a simple translation layer. And so you can write, you can move your information onto new devices with unprecedented speed. And there's very good evidence of this, which I'd be happy to tell you about. And it gets even better because your data is going to change. You're going to get uh, you're going to swap out your, your holdings database or your user data is going to change or whatever. Of course you are because you're in a dynamic environment. Doesn't matter. So thing up here will break because everything's going to go through an API. And when you change one of these, you, one of your techies is going to update the API so that it's speaking the same language. So all the changes can happen underneath and your apps and your services and your sites, don't, they don't change at all. They just keep on working. So, uh, and it gets even better because you're going to add new types of information over time. I don't know what it is. Neither do you. That's the point. It's new. It hasn't been invented yet. So let's say you, it turns out you need to add some sensors or big data becomes important. Great. Shove it in. The API will handle, will make it easy for your applications and services and sites and devices to get at it. So you are in a very dynamic, difficult environment. Plus, you have all work. You've got workflows. You've got information that's triggering other information. All that changes over time as well. APIs provide stability. At the same time, if you choose to make your data public, they open up your resources to the entire world, which can do what they, they can invent what they want. The 15-year-old the in another country can, can build what she thought of, because your data is sitting there, and you've made public how to use the API. So this is an example of one thing that our lab um, created that rides, it uses the API. Underneath this, every time you use this, the user is talking to the API. Of course, the user doesn't know it. So this is called Stack Life. That I'll, the, I'll put the address up at the end again. Uh, and this is an alternative OPAC. Harvard has a great, OPA, has a great online catalog. Um, my group had an idea to do it differently. We didn't have to ask permission. We just had to use the API, the, the API that we built. So in this case, Stack Life, um, when you search for a book, The Divine Comedy, it always shows you, in the shows you that work in the context of all the other works in the library um, as if they were arranged on a physical shelf, right? Because this is just a shelf tilted upwards. So this is where you would actually see. These are the neighbors you would see on the shelves, except that this actually combines the 73 different libraries at Harvard. So, but it is a very familiar metaphor. But it would be, uh, and the, the uh, length of the, the height of the book is the actual height. The thickness is the number of pages. Um, but it would be silly just to reproduce the physical shelves, right? I mean, that's, if that's all you wanted to do. So we display for each book um, the Library of Congress subject headings. And if you click on one of the different subject headings, like poetry, we now show you the same work in the context of all the works that share that subject heading. Um, I will come back to, to the blueness of that. Oh, that's interesting. So this is this is the second example, and I'm so I, this, I am an amateur programmer. This is an amateur program. One of the points is that e, I'm a very bad amateur programmer. That somebody at my level of skill uh, can still do something like this. So there's a I'm not just bragging. There's a reason I'm showing you this. So in this case, this, um, if you type in a phrase and click on search Google Books there. This app uses the Google Books API. Google Books has an API. So you can write a program that searches Google's book, Google Books, which is exactly what this does. It goes through, and here are the top 10 returns from Google Books. So I'm looking inside of the book to find some text, the full text search of the book. But because we are now using APIs, 
use the Google API to search Google Books, I can then take each of the returns that therefore contain the phrase every book its reader, and I can then query the Harvard API and ask, is this book, does Harvard have this book? Does Harvard have this book? I'm asking the API. Does Harvard have this book? Well, it's gray, so we don't. This one, yes. This one, no. And this is this shelf is the shelf of books that have every book its reader in the text. All right, so look it up at Google Books, search for those books in the Harvard Library, in both cases using an API. So we've mashed up Google Books and, um, and the Harvard Library. In effect, what this means is Harvard Library, like all libraries, just about, does not have a full text index of all of its works. We, haven't, we have not scanned everything and built an index. In effect, I am now searching, doing a full text search of Harvard Library by using Google Books. The important point is two APIs mashed together open up worlds of possibility, even to amateur programmers. OK, so I want to come back to here, because I did not explain why some of the books are darker blue than others. Um, <clears throat> so the depth of the color blue, and this has everything to do with library communities learning, libraries learning from their communities. So the depth of the color blue indicates how important or relevant that work is to the Harvard community. If it's very light blue, then hardly anybody is touching it, reading it, taking it out. We compute this through a, by giving some weight points to things, to metadata that we know about, and we just sort of made up why, why faculty check out each one of them counts for four points and grad students three points. There's no science here. This is just a guess. Nevertheless, even with a guess, you get a really interesting and useful way of seeing what's relevant to to the community. The university community is a pretty smart community, and it's good to know. If you don't know anything about population genetics, and you look for it, and um, it shows you, well, here's what people at your community, in this case Harvard, here's what the Harvard community is reading about population genetics. That's a pretty good indication that those works are pro probably pretty worthwhile books, worthwhile works. But if you do that, then you're continuing to send people back to what Harvard is already reading. And every time you do that, so I, oh, I, say, I see that book is very well read by Harvard, so I check it out and I read it. I just made it more blue. And so we get into a cycle of blueness. And that's, that's a real problem. That's a community that is learning from itself. That's great, but is stuck in, in a bubble of, of relevancy. So what I really, really want to see happen, this is one of the reasons we did this um, this project in the first place, is I want to be able to say, to say, OK, this is what's being, well, we'll go back to the divine comedy. Here are the works that, um, the poetic works that uh, are important to Harvard. Do you want to see what is important at, NY, at New York Public or et cetera, et cetera, or et cetera? And if you say yes, what it should do, it doesn't do this, but it should, go to those libraries um, and get their scores and show you, you know what? Uh, at the National Library of India, here are, here are 10 works that are being heavily read by that community that Harvard is paying no attention to. Would you like to learn from that community? And the answer should always be yes. But to do this, we need a way of comparing usage, which is difficult. And so I've been proposing something called stack score, where you compute a score based upon some set of factors, like how often it's taken out or put on reserve and so forth. You compute it, but then you also um, uh, score it from 1 to 100. And having done that, you can then compare two libraries incredibly easy, easily. This is in the top 20. Uh, here, This is number 80 at Cornell or National Library of India. And it's uh, 80 at Harvard. And now you've got a direct comparison. But, and this I think is key, it may be that different libraries will accord points differently. Maybe National Library of India is going to give a lot of points to user reviews or librarian picks. And maybe at Harvard, they don't do that. It should be up to each community to decide what are the markers of relevance, of importance to that community. So one of the ways this will happen, if it happens, is we can imagine that lots of libraries start having APIs. It's a good way to manage your IT. And if they do that, then they can talk with one another. 
the APIs can, and we can start to learn from different communities and expand ourselves. Or maybe there will be regional or national APIs that libraries use instead of installing their own. Because it's not, I'm not saying it's simple to install an API, but if there were one that was built by, say, a government to serve libraries, then we'd have much more communication among them. So we get smart services, we get smarter information, we get smarter networks. Um, I know that I have talked about technology, but I've only, I only care about tech, except as a hobby, um, because technology, what we've actually been talking about, I think, is meaning, the relevancy of works to a community, how they make sense of it to themselves, and how we can learn from the ways in which other communities make sense of things. So ultimately, I think this is a, a, an infrastructure for shared meaning and for distributed meaning and for meaning that respects cultural differences and local differences and learns from those and celebrates those as opposed to reducing everything to single scores, single file cards, little rectangles. This is a way, in part, of letting a community see what matters to it, and thus having that matter more, and then learn how to have it matter differently. Who can help, who can help communities do this? As far as I can tell, there's only one answer to that question. It is only libraries that can help communities see what matters to them and learn from other communities, expand their idea of what matters. It is only libraries that can do this. There is nobody else. There's no other. If there's another institution, let me know. But the, there isn't. It is only libraries that can do this. And I believe that this is also absolutely essential and central to the meaning of libraries themselves. So I'm very enthusiastic about this new technology that's emerging because of its ability to make more meaning in the world. Thank you. This, and this is a bunch of the links. Thank you, Professor David, for a wonderful presentation. Now we can take three to four questions from the audience. Uh-oh, the, the person who knows linked data. <laughs> uh, I have just kind of very preliminary question because, uh, you know, these days, this coding that we get like Amazon, you are reading this, those who have purchased that, other people have also, that's how people get interested. Now, in your plan, library has to be brought into that network where some people is reading and they are going and collecting data from libraries that in that library uh, people read it. Uh, but unless this is made, forcefully made library also as a part of the network, this, this information will never come. Well, okay, so um, let me be clear. I mean, what is happening for Harvard, Stanford? Can it be done worldwide? Is it really possible to bring? So um, I, I've tried to make an implicit argument. Let me make it explicit, because it's a really wonderful question. It is, I think, the... Um, so um, I started uh, proposing and then organizing the building of Library Cloud, the Harvard API. Uh, it took about four and a half years from start to finish. And the re one of the reasons it took so long was that I kept arguing to the library that the library ought to do this because it will make op data openly available. It's part of the educational mandate, mission. It's what we should be doing. And then people will build applications we'd never think of. And that argument turned out not to be effective, although it's true. Um, what turned out to be the effective argument was an API like Library Cloud is a wonderful way to manage. It's the right technical infrastructure for a library, and I believe of any size. Now, Harvard's special, Harvard is big, Harvard is rich, Harvard is Harvard, so it um, can devote some resources to building this, and that's all an incredible privilege, absolutely. But I, th I think and I hope, um, because API-based platforms are emerging in lots of areas, not just libraries, Facebook is built upon an open platform well, has opened up a platform in 2006. And so this is becoming more and more common. Um, that it's becoming recognized that APIs have value because of the stability they provide to a, a, an information infrastructure that is complicated, that has lots of different sorts of information, has to support lots of different outputs. API is the right technical infrastructure. It pays for itself. It's not a complex technology. It's, you can find, you can, there's lots of open source stuff. So I think it is possible that libraries will um, start using APIs uh, simply because it makes their life easier. And I suspect that especially as you go from a, a huge, rich library like Harvard's down to local libraries that are struggling 
in a, in a small community, that APIs will show up as part of the ILS, the back-end technology that's being used. And I think that all may be shortcut by the um, building of national APIs. You know, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom, uh, England is thinking about doing this. They have, they're doing some work on it already. That will, uh, and there's open source possibilities. And having a, a, a cloud-based API that you as a library can subscribe to for free or for very little money that provides the sort of services that you're currently paying a lot of money for um, and doing so in an environment where you can share information, where your users have access to more, where you can learn, that seems to me to be a plausible way that this will actually happen. Um, it won't happen if it means going to every local library and saying, may I, may I please speak to your advanced technologist and uh, have a bunch of that person's time and money so I can build it. That's not going to happen. But I do think there's a way forward. Last question. We can take one question. First of all, thank you very much for making such a, a wonderful picture of, of the <laughs> developments. It's really interesting. Uh, one of the things that I think what I certainly find irritating about a Google search is that, although I do use Google and I appreciate it, first page always looks terrific. Second page looks quite good. By the time you get to page four, it looks like a, a bad party at three o'clock in the morning. You know, there's empty packers on the floor and there's crumbs on the couch and it's not worth going any further, right? So it's a difference between getting quantitative high but qualitatively low. And what I'm seeing there with when you were showing that image where there was just thousands of connections, it seemed to me that there were connections, but not necessarily the commentary, the opinions, the views, the interpretations that then give you roadmaps to try and clarify the stuff that you would really want to have as opposed to all the other stuff that's just there because there is a, a quantitative connection somewhere between the words. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I'm just wondering what do you see in the future about having some way of in building that so that you can get the qualitative um, nicety that you really need, that the researchers actually want. I don't know that yes. people keep wanting more and more and more. Absolutely. They just want better and better and better. Yes, but the, so that's, again, a wonderful question. Um, you, this is the huge mess that we're generating. And we're generating it without ever saying, I think it's a good thing that we don't, we're not saying, huh, here's 25 billion pieces of information. I wonder if this one will be interesting. Well, I better hold back on that. Because it may not be interesting, it, but it may never in the history, future history of humankind show up. But you can't know that. You don't know, nobody knows what's going to happen or how things are going to be connected. So the first task, from my point of view, is get it all in. Get as much of, just sweep it together into huge messes, and we'll sort it out later. <laughs> Trying to get the sort of, of recommendations and paths, the commentaries and the rest of it is a never, there is no, as I'm sure you, I think you'll agree, there is no one right answer. What is the right set of commentaries on this? It is so dependent on culture, on your task, on your personality, on your time, how much time you have, that there is no possibility of coming up with the single one set of right recommendations or right links. And so what we need, from my point of view, is to have everything put together uh, that we can poss that might possibly be relevant, and then start to build, as we have, start to build systems that enable users to browse more efficiently and more effectively, depending on what they're trying to do at that moment. This includes if sometimes you want to be distracted by a pop-up saying, oh, I see you're interested. Maybe you'll be interested next. But a lot of times, if you're a researcher, you don't want that. You just want to be heads down and focus. We have different. Um, needs and styles and wants at different times of the day and different tasks. So first thing to do is get all that information together. That's the, the basis on which we can then start to invent, endlessly, endlessly invent ways of browsing that make Amazon's attempt to sell us the next book look as pathetic and venal as it is. But first you have to get all that stuff together. But, so you're absolutely right. Showing this huge mass, that's the potential energy. The, the actual, the kinetic energy will come from the 15-year-olds who are inventing new ways to traverse new paths. Thank you. Thank you, Professor yeah. David. Thank Wonder. you so much. It is to present oh. a moment.
Of course. Thank you. Thank you very much.